Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for coming. Um, we are really, really excited. This is our first of three webinars. Uh, it's highlighting the work and amazing, amazing careers of these um, Smithsonian women scientists. And uh, there are so many more of you than we anticipated. Uh, and that's super exciting for us to, uh, to see the, the need for this type of programming. So thank you all for coming. We're going to start with some introductions. Um, my name is Cody Coltharp. I'm an interactive designer at the Office of the Undersecretary for Education. And uh, so our office is a central education office or established to define educational priorities at the Smithsonian. Uh, we oversee tons and tons of educational components of the Smithsonian's collective initiatives. We do communication strategies and uh, funding for programs that benefit lifelong learners of all ages. Thanks, Cody, for that introduction. And thanks to all of you for coming uh, and sharing uh, some secrets of the sea with us this afternoon or evening or middle of the day, depending on where you're listening from. Um, I'm a coral reef biologist and I've worked for the Smithsonian for almost my entire career. I started off at the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute in Panama and most recently uh, I was the SANT Chair of Marine Science at the National Museum of Natural History in Washington, D.C., where I also uh, helped lead the Ocean Portal uh, website. Uh, during this time, I've written the book, Citizens of the Sea, and I'm also the co-founder of a Twitter campaign, hashtag Ocean Optimism, in an effort to uh, shift the focus away from the doom and gloom and uh, to solutions and success stories. So I'm really looking forward to the presentation and particularly to getting questions from all of you uh, later uh, in this presentation. Talk to you then. All right. Thanks, Dr. Knowlton. Um, she's actually being humble. Her full title is actually Dr. Nancy Knowlton, former Senate Chair of the Marine Science, Khaleesi, Protector of the Seven Kingdoms and Mother of Dragons. Um, so uh, so today's schedule, um, I'm going to go over a brief overview of the three webinars and uh, then a general overview of today's project, which is Secret of the Seas. And uh, after that, we're going to dive into each of the individual components of that project, and then we'll end with a Q&A with Dr. Knowlton. Um, so quickly here, let's do an overall description of, um, of the main project here. Uh, so like I said earlier, this is the first of three webinars. We're sh sharing these three project kits, and they're meant to inspire your students by sharing these stories and work of the uh, three contemporary Smithsonian scientists. Um, so why, why are we doing this? The, the inspiration of these kits, uh, we released a video about 10 years ago called How to Be a Scientist, uh, and that was featuring the National Museum of Natural History volcanologist, uh, Dr. Elizabeth Cottrell. And in the video, she talks about her work and what it's like to be a scientist at the Smithsonian. It's kind of a, kind of a normal video. Um, and uh, for whatever reason, it became very, very popular on on YouTube to be like the number one thing that anyone time any anytime anyone punches in, how do I be a scientist? That video comes up. So you, we have like hundreds and thousands of views on it, and hundreds and hundreds of comments from from young people all over the world saying things like, "Hi, I'm I'm 13 years old and I live in Jakarta and I I really want to be a scientist just like you, Dr. Liz, and thank you." And all of these people are, are supporting each other and, and saying like, you know, I believe you can be a scientist. I think you can do it. You just got to keep working hard. You can do it. And I, I don't know if you've ever been to any comment section anywhere on the Internet. It's, it's just a surprise. You don't you don't expect it at all. Um, so super, super fantastic, super wholesome, wholesome comments that are so inspiring. We wanted to make more content like that. And so that's where the, the three of these are, are kind of coming out of. Um, each of the kits has free and, you know, everything is totally free online um, classroom ready materials highlighting each of the scientists career journey, the importance of their work. Uh, they all use a range of high touch to high tech educational uh, resources. So, for example, like a super, super high tech um, online interactive or 360 video, as well as classroom activities. Um, that have hands-on activities uh, in, in, in them. So, okay, so we're gonna go over a quick description of today's kit, The Secrets of the Sea. Um, it's kind of beginning was a question of like, how do we get our students to care about climate change? And so 
you know, it's, it's a hard, hard problem. Um, I, I think it, it's really tough to, for students to wrap their heads around. It's either too big for them or it feels too far from the future or they feel like it doesn't concern them. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a big challenge to teach. Uh, and then the second part of that challenge is how do we teach it without focusing on all the doom and gloom? Um, watching videos of Dr. Knowlton, that approach of scaring people into action, it just doesn't work. Sharing a, a bunch of negative data, you, you know, people just don't respond to it. So um, her whole her whole thing is we have to try a different approach um, to teaching it. So that's what this kit is. Um, during the webinar, we're going to go through all three of these major main kit elements: the um, standards-aligned classroom activity, the online digital interactive game, and a video biography of Dr. Knowlton. And luckily, at the end of this talk, we'll also have an opportunity for Q&A with Dr. Knowlton. Um, thank you again, Dr. Knowlton, for sharing your time with us. I know you have had a very busy retirement and uh, maybe you need to retire from your retirement because you're working way too hard, um, but we appreciate your time. So uh, we have a short trailer that introduces the project, but before, uh, before it starts, before we show it, we have a question for the chat and you can just um, drop your, your answers through uh, throughout the whole talk in the chat. Um, but that question is, what do you struggle with the most in teaching climate change? So it is a, it's a hard, hard thing and a lot, a lot of struggles with it. So what do you struggle the most with? All right, so we are gonna play that trailer video. And uh, again, feel free to, um, to put your responses in the chat. Since the extinction of the dinosaurs, coral reefs have been the most diverse marine ecosystems on the planet, providing shelter and food for generations of ocean life. What mysteries are hidden within waiting to be discovered? Dive into an incredible underwater adventure in the Smithsonian's Secrets of the Sea online game. You'll navigate the hidden treasures of a coral reef, discovering the connections between the tiniest plants to the largest predators. The more you discover, the closer you will be to recreating a healthy ecosystem, returning life to the coral reef. Your guide on your submerged quest is Dr. Nancy Knowlton, renowned marine biologist and former SANT Chair for Marine Science at the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History. Visit the Smithsonian Learning Lab and start your adventure. Okay, super sort trailer. <laughs> it's a teaser. Um, so uh, what you're seeing on your screen right now is the main splash, and you can get to that. Um, we have a link in the chat, but you, you can get to that page by going to s.si.edu slash secrets of the sea. And uh, so when you get there, there's the, the main kind of picture. But if you scroll down a little bit, you can see all three of the major kit components. Um, so there all the way on the left is the link to the online game. Uh, Dr. Knowlton's biography video is in the center, and we are going to start all the way on the right on the little learn um, animated GIF. If you click that, it'll lead to the classroom activity. And uh, so this activity is, I don't know if you recognize this website, but this is facilitated through the Smithsonian's Learning Lab platform. And uh, so I'm not going to go into too much detail about the Learning Lab right now, but if you're not familiar with it, I highly, highly recommend checking it out. Um, it's, its website link is learninglab.si.edu, um, and you can find thousands and thousands of activities teachers like you have created uh, using millions and millions of Smithsonian resources found there. So highly recommend it if you're not familiar with it. Um, but this is just one of thousands. Uh, it's targeted primarily to fourth and fifth grade students, which is reflected through the, the next generation science standards that we have, uh, but it could totally be easily scaled up or down. Um, so this collection has six modular activities. Uh, they're yours to adapt, um, to scale up or down to your classroom. Use part of it, use all of it, use none of it, totally remake it. It's up to you. Um, you're, you're the pros. Uh, you can see that there's these kind of horizontal lines that run across and each one of those roughly uh, represent an activity. And you can see they're, they're bookended by those matching um, text blocks at the start and at the end of each row. So um, there are these six major sections. Uh, I'll go over each one very briefly. Um, in the first one, they're going to be exploring three videos about what coral is, 
how it grows into a reef and all the really hard to pronounce parts of coral um, that I will, <laughs> I'll save the, the ASL uh, from, from having to, to write out. Um, and so after exploring these videos, uh, they have a Harvard Project Zero thinking routine prompt. And uh, that's, that's pretty common throughout this whole activity. Um, it's looking at resources, having some sort of critical thinking question or a reflection about that. And then often there's some sort of related activity. So the next line, you can see it starts with the green tab. Uh, it's all about the sea life that makes its home in the reef. Um, so the reef isn't just this network of organisms, but it's home also to many, many, many sea creatures. And uh, at the end of that, there's another PZ thinking routine, uh, Sea Think Wonder. And uh, after they're done with the Sea Think Wonder routine, we often recommend having them go through and, and play the online interactive, uh, which we will go over in just a moment, but that's the last link in that row. Uh, so after they've played the game, it's really cool to kind of come back and go back into this third row. And that has uh, uh, items, actual specimens from the, the Smithsonian's collections that were all featured in the game. Uh, I think Dr. Knowlton might have collected some of these. <laughs> uh, Nancy, maybe you recognize some of them. Uh, but it's a, it's a fun, oh, I saw this in the game type of activity. And then they can really see the real thing, look closely, zoom in. Uh, and then they'll do another PZ routine, uh, parts, purposes, and complexities, and that really hones in the, the learning uh, that they got from the game. Um, so that leads to the fourth row, uh, the one in blue. It's um, all about coral bleaching. What is it? What happens? Can the coral recover? How? Um, and then after that reflection question, it's kind of a heavy topic, so we have this optional hands-on activity where students are reconstructing a, a coral polyp using marshmallows and gummy worms. Um, it's kind of fun and delicious. Uh, on to the fifth row. Um, again, it's it's this feeling of, of being kind of overwhelmed and this feeling of helplessness. It's such a huge problem. Uh, but here are these, these uh, great resources that show steps that they can do to help um, help as well as stories of behavior changes that have led to positive impact. Uh, for example, the, the third is a, a blog that Dr. Knowlton wrote that's documentation of a reef that was, uh, it was one time bleached and then returned to health. And so it introduces those uh, really important concepts like resilience and resistance in the reef. Um, and again, the idea is yes, climate change is hard. It's this big, difficult problem, but here are some, some things that we're doing that could possibly help or, or that has helped and uh, it's a good time then to share the video of Dr. Knowlton. Um, and we'll go over the video in, in, in a little bit, but uh, it's, a, it's a great video that shows like, it's not all about the doom and gloom, but stories of optimism. And uh, that's really what kind of led her to, to being part of the founding member of the, the uh, Earth Optimism Movement. And lastly, in the sixth row, uh, we have some kind of bonus content about the fun relationships that exist on a reef. They see some of it in the game. Some of it are new to them, um, but it's, it's kind of a blooper reel. Uh, it's a lot of fun. And then the last tile in this collection is a feedback prompt. You know, we're, we're constantly on the lookout on, on how to improve these resources. And you all know best what's working with your students and what isn't. So we are always looking for feedback from you all um, and, and ways that we can improve our what we do. Um, and as you're kind of looking through all of these all of these different resources, uh, many of them are from the Smithsonian's Ocean Portal. It's our official gateway to oceanic research. If you're looking for really great ocean science, um, this really should be your first place to go. And we will leave that um, that link to the Ocean Portal in the chat as well. Okay, so that is the um, classroom activity. We're going to switch gears a little bit and uh, jump into the online interactive. Um, but before we jump into the game, uh, maybe another question for the chat. And that is, how do you typically teach the food web? And also, how do you teach the transfer of energy from sun to all life forms? And that is the heart of what this game is all about. All right, so to access the game, you can either click that link right there in the collection, or you can go back to the main um, splash site that we had we had shared previously. Um, so while while it's loading, the game is fully closed caption. It works across modern desktop browsers. I know downloading in schools is is uh, usually a no no. 
uh, requires no software downloads. So um, you can see it right now, it's muted. You'd normally hear uh, Dr. Knowlton narrating the entire experience um, or the, the soundtrack we actually got. Lin Manuel Miranda to do it, um, and it's like full of some real bangers. Like we don't talk about clownfish, uh, and you know you should play it just for the soundtrack, um, really. So uh, okay, so she's in the game, and um, we've jumped a little bit ahead in the game. When you first start, there's an introduction scene, and it gives some instruction on on how you can play and how to move, and it's just an onboarding scene. So we've skipped that so that you can see the kind of main level. Um, but in the game, your students are navigating this 3D coral reef, and uh, what you're seeing are 3D scans of coral, um, actual coral specimens from the Smithsonian's collections, and uh, the whole point of it is to discover the connections of sea life in this reef. And uh, as the students kind of navigating around, you can see a lot of these um, organisms are they're like white and as they come close to the organism they kind of discover that organism and that's represented by its color returning so they rec they recover it and it, it goes from white to, to color and that's kind of a metaphor for the bleached reef coming back to life it starts with this like white and gray and muted color but as they discover more and more sea life more sea life begin to appear and uh, the, the color begins to return to the reef um, so, for example, uh, as as the as the students exploring, they can find four sea grass, and that unlocks a sea star, uh, which eats the grass. And so, if if they find the sea star, that in turn allows for another species to return. And uh, and when you find that species, more and more uh, species return on and on and on uh, up and across the web. Um, at any given time, you can kind of check your status on on restoring that web by pressing the tab key, and uh, that displays uh, the entire food web and, and clicking on any one of those question marks will show the dependencies for each of the organisms, as well as hence, like if you already have those dependencies completed on, on where to find them in the reef. Um, so pretty great. Uh, finding all of a particular species, like for example, there, there are six seagrass to find. If you find them all, it'll play a fun cutscene animation. Um, Dr. Knowlton narrates it a little bit and she tells a little bit about that organism. Finally, when all of the organisms are recovered, so you've, you've done this entire food web, uh, the students have recreated a healthy ecosystem and uh, the game ends with a fun bit of cooperative hunting uh, by the, the reef's apex predators showing that the reef is fully capable of sustaining this wide network of organisms. Um, it takes about 30 to 45 minutes to complete the entire game. And again, when they're done, it, it all goes back to that main thesis question of what do you think happens to this life when climate changes the oceans? And they're all connected. Uh, so if one element gone, it, it really affects them all. So that is the game. We've gone over the student activity. We've gone over the game. This uh, final element and everything is a biographical video of Dr. Knowlton, whose research it's all based on. Um, we're not going to play the video because she's here, uh, but in the video she goes over a glimpse of her career that's just an incredible career. It's, it's spanned decades. She's been studying the changes in the oceans for years. Um, but something also pretty neat about the video, it also introduces this next generation of scientists and researchers uh, that are using cutting edge technology to, to understand the impact that we have on our oceans. Um, so it's also really neat to see that kind of next generation. I guess I could just begin by saying that um... Uh, although I've worked a lot at the Smithsonian, I've also worked at a pro as a professor at, at universities. And particularly when I was working at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography, I, was in, I helped found a program called the Center for Marine Biodiversity and Conservation. And that program had lots of students in it. And uh, it was really, I used to think of it as kind of medical school for the ocean. So the idea was that we would um, uh, give students the tools that they could use to help keep the ocean healthy or repair its health when it was in trouble. And we always started that class with a, just sort of a litany, a long list of all the things that were wrong with the ocean. So overfishing, pollution, climate change, ocean acidification, invasive species, destruction of habitats. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty depressing way to begin a class. And I started to realize after we did this for a couple of years that it wasn't necessarily really what the students wanted or certainly what they needed to hear. And then I, I reflected back on the 
on the on the whole idea of medical school. And I thought, well, you know, in medical school, uh, the students uh, who are learning to be doctors, they're not trained how to write obituaries. And yet I felt um, what we were doing is training our students to write ever more refined obituaries of the ocean. And so that led me to really rethink how to talk about the problems. And, um, and it, it inspired a series of symposia called Beyond the Obituaries, uh, Success Stories in Ocean Conservation. The first one was held actually at the Smithsonian in 2009 and a number of other events as well. And what I came to realize is that is that you, if you just, I mean, it's, it, you have to talk about the problems, but if you only talk about the problems and you don't talk about what can be done and what people are actually already doing, then, then it leads to a sense of helplessness and apathy and despair rather than the action you really want to inspire uh, young people to take. And so it was really uh, interacting with students, uh, much as you all do, um, that inspired this complete change in the way I approached the problem of climate change and the ocean health in general, to move from one that, which was just sort of listing all the big problems with a sort of a few little answers at the end, to starting with the answers and the solutions to the successes, and then sort of looping back and, and thinking about the science that, that underpins them and, and why the problems are serious. It's important to emphasize the problems, but if that's all you do, then you'll, you'll lose students very quickly. And I think that um, that certainly has been my finding. And I think looking at, uh, to the extent that I can follow the chat, it seems to be some of your findings as well. So that's sort of my initial uh, re uh, response to this, you know, how to approach climate change. Um, so we have the first question in the chat, and that is from an anonymous attendee. What is your biggest inspiration? The energy and then also the creativity, the amazing solutions that are coming from young people uh, inspire me every single day. The next question is, is the, the kit free or is there a subscription required? And so, yes, everything here is, is completely 100% free. Um, you don't need a subscription. You can, you can play it. Uh, you don't need any special software or special computer. You can just do it through your browser. Uh, okay, so we have another question here. Um, what would you say to a teacher uh, whose, whose students say that the media makes them feel hopeless or, or feels like they just have no power over making a change? You know, I, th I think it's really important to not just read one bad story, one bad news story. You can assimilate it. You can recognize that it's a a big problem, but then keep looking, keep searching and find those stories that are also there about people making a difference. And I guess I would, you know, if I were standing in front of a classroom on a daily basis, you know, make it part of my routine and sort of every day say, talk about, this is what I learned this morning before uh, I came in or last night after class. And I wanted to share the story with you and sort of just take a couple of minutes to talk about something that's, 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 that's working. And I think that's a huge antidote to depression and despair. Are there any tips for those of us who are not near the ocean, perhaps ways uh, that rivers and lakes link to ocean health? It may seem like if you're in, uh, in uh, Illinois or Colorado that you're not very connected to the ocean, but everything that goes into a river or even a little stream winds up in the ocean. So that means all the plastic that winds that you that winds its way into um, a, a river or stream winds up in the ocean or all the other kinds of pollution. For example, in the Gulf of Mexico, there's this giant area which doesn't have enough, has almost no oxygen in it. And that's due to pollution from using too much fertilizers in, right in the center of the country in the Midwest. So everything you do is, uh, even in the middle of a continent like the United States, um, is actually connected to the ocean. Yeah, yeah. So the the last one, I think a really important question, how do you do you have any suggestions for engaging um, black and brown girls in science, people of color, uh, engage, engaging or maybe encouraging them? You know, what do you what do you have to say? Um? That is a super important question. And it's one that I think uh, everyone in the conservation world is really thinking about. I um, I know one of the one effort that I know of that is very successful on Twitter. That might be a little old for the, I don't know about all the students, but there's a whole program called Black and Marine Science on Twitter. Uh, and they are, and there's, there's just a lot of work. It's not just, uh, and, and indigenous people are increasingly uh, playing an important role in ocean conservation. I think the biggest transformation that's occurred in thinking about conservation 
um, has been that we can't succeed without everyone playing a role and including all the local communities, many of whom are paying a much bigger price in terms of climate change and the poor health of the ocean than, than, than others. Thank you so much, Dr. Nolan. I, you know, I, I just like, I just like, I wish you just, you know, narrated everything wherever, wherever I was going. Um, you're just so good at, uh, at just so interesting. Uh, again, thank you all so much for your participation and uh, hope to see you in a couple weeks.